S&P 500 on track for its best three-day run of the year after Friday's Goldilocks jobs report put a possible rate cut back on the table. Now, earlier this morning, Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari writing in an essay that progress on disinflation is stalling. This comes ahead of his speech later today. So for more on the Fed's path forward, we are joined in studio by Elise Osbaugh, global investment strategist at J.P. Morgan Private Bank. Elise, thank you so much for being here in person. We really appreciate it. I know that we just got this Neil Kashkari essay out, but as we were talking about before, he talked about the housing inflation ele- elephant in the room. And I'm curious if we know that 95 percent of homeowners are locked into these 30-year fixed mortgage rates. At what point does a higher for longer env- environment start to become inflationary because it's keeping people in their houses for longer? Look, especially as it relates to that shelter component of inflation, this is something that we have been kicking around and kind of debating. But when you look at the higher frequency data, specifically as it relates to rentals, it's still suggesting that you should see that formal shelter component continue to come down. I think even or as importantly is what's going on in the labor market, where you've still got this really robust foundation, but things like quits rates are coming down, that ratio of job openings to unemployed people is coming down, and it should alleviate some of the pressure on corporates to continue passing higher wage costs on to end consumers. And so those are the levers that we're expecting to really help us get over this final hump of inflation that ultimately will give the Fed confidence that they need to start cutting interest rates probably in the fourth quarter of this year. So at least given those expectations, when we talk about the likely trading activity that we're going to see between now and year end, how do you see that playing out? Well, I think last week was a perfect example of the fact that the Fed still does kind of seem to be in the driver's seat when it comes to investor sentiment. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned that we're coming off of the best three-day rally in the S&P 500 that we've seen since November, and that happened only once the market repriced the probability of, you know, one, maybe two rate cuts coming Mm -hmm. later this year. So it does seem like some sort of condition, but even that aside, we're encouraged by the fact that, especially for the S&P 500, those companies still look really really well capitalized. They've got strong interest coverage ratios, but something investors need to watch is a potential metastasis of this credit stress, because when you look at smaller and medium-sized companies, their interest coverage ratios are lower than they were before the pandemic, and so that could potentially be kind of the next pocket that starts to feel that pinch of higher rates. When could that risk start to come to fruition, and what would be the indication that that's starting to happen? I think you've got to continue to you know look at things like hiring plans, especially amongst those small companies given that they employ about 75% of the labor force, but also just you know listening to things like corporate earnings calls, even beyond the S&P 500, for indication on how those executives might be feeling about future plans. But otherwise, we are watching every single data print, all of the inflation data, to continue to monitor and kind of recheck the outlook that we've put forward that the Fed will cut interest rates one time by year end. Elise, let's talk about what we were just speaking with uh, Josh about uh, just a few moments ago when we were talking about the large buybacks, the momentum that we've seen there. Talk to us just about the support that you think maybe this is potentially providing to the market and how big of a tailwind this could be for stock. Sure. So in the U.S., agree with everything Josh Mm -hmm. said about this offering kind of a nice foundation Mm -hmm. for investors. I think another thing we've really been encouraged by is simply the amount of, you know, capital expenditure plans that some of these companies in the S&P 500 are really putting forward. That's going to continue to power these trends that have offered a lot of support for the market, like AI, and we're looking for that trade to really start broadening out beyond these initial enablers. But even outside of the United States, right, it's notable to kind of observe that even European companies are, you know, starting to engage in buyback activity, which is creating these, you know, total cash yields in addition to the high dividends that you get in Europe Mm -hmm. that offer a really compelling kind of foundation for total returns for investors. So definitely a market worth looking at, especially as the macro backdrop starts to improve in that region as well. When it comes to earnings, one thing I'm curious about is that we're starting to see EPS coming in above revenue. And it makes me wonder if we're seeing companies that are really good at efficiency, getting good at cutting costs more so than a growth story. To what extent is that something that you're concerned about for market upside? Sure. So I think it's a good thing that profit margins are improving versus last quarter. And we should be encouraged by the fact, especially in this environment where everyone one's concerned about sticky inflation, that I think these companies learned how to manage those costs and navigate a world of inflation that's maybe running between 3 to 4% because they had to deal with it when it was pushing 10 
As for the underlying demand, I continue to be really encouraged about the backdrop there. You know, thinking back to the GDP report that we got for the first quarter of the year, that headline, I think, obfuscated the dynamics that were going on underneath the surface, which is a picture of domestic demand that remains really robust when you look at that measure of final purchases to private domestic purchasers um, still running at a steady and strong level. And you like tech, healthcare, consumer discretionary. Can you tell me what the biggest momentum factors might be for those in our final minute with you? Sure. So as far as the consumer is concerned, obviously the backbone of the U.S. economy, but we really think that the positive real wage growth dynamic is going to continue to support ongoing consumer spending. And that's one of the sectors that's entering you know, the strong phase of this rolling earnings recovery that we've been observing. And then for tech, it's really about that AI trade. That, I think, is going to continue to kind of be the biggest tailwind. We are absolutely believers in it. And as I mentioned before, we think that the strength is going to continue to broaden out beyond just those initial enablers. Elise, thank you so much. Thanks thank for joining you. us in thank studio. You. We really appreciate it. That was Elise Osenbaugh, Global Investment Strategist at JP Morgan Private Bank.